This presentation is about Catherine Kolkaba's comfort theory. So Catherine, or Kathy Kolkaba, was born in 1944, and she's currently living in Columbia, Ohio, with her husband at age 76. So in 1965, she earned her registered nurse, and then she worked part-time in med surge, long-term care, home health, and as the head nurse on a dementia unit. And on that dementia unit is where she started to kind of develop the comfort theory and realize that comfort is so important as to um, pay attention to as nurses. She then grad she then worked on her MSN and graduated with her MSN with a specialty in gerontology in 1987. After that, she joined the faculty at the University of Akron in the College of Nursing, and she was teaching gerontology. In 1991, she developed the comfort theory, um, and they developed it over 10 years, and she did it with her husband, who is a philosopher. In 1999, she received her doctorate, and... Um, submitted the comfort theory as her dissertation. Her favorite quote is that if I can stop one heart from breaking, I shall not live in vain. If I can ease one life, the aching, or cool the pain, or help one fainting robin unto his nest again, I shall not live in vain. That's by Emily Dickinson, and she says that um, that quote helped her through nursing school and has been a uh, driving force for her through her life. So for her background, she started to theorize comfort when working as the head nurse on the dementia unit, and she has experience working in all the places that I mentioned before. She currently has a website called comfortline.com that she uses to spread information about the comfort theory, and she helps institutions implement the comfort theory into their care. Um, all of her tools are free on her website, and she just wants to help um, spread the comfort theory as much as she can and to develop it as much as possible. A quote from her is, My vision is comfort care for all, which includes patients first and foremost, their families, staff, institutions, including hospitals, nursing homes, and agencies, student nurses, and communities. I fervently believe that nurses want to provide comfort care. It is the reason we choose nursing as our life's work. So now to dive into the comfort theory. So people have... The assumptions of the comfort theory are that people have holistic responses to complex stimuli um, and that comfort is a desirable outcome that is related to nursing. And then also that people wish to meet or have their comfort needs met. Um, so basically people want to be comfortable. We need to keep comfort um, as part of our nursing and people will react whenever they're stimulated in a holistic manner. So, in building the comfort theory, um, basically what Kathy says is that comfort is a source of strength and healing, and the first dimension of the comfort theory is the different states that you can be in, and they are relief, ease, and transcendence. So, relief um, is basically where you have relief from needs, and it's necessary to... Um, return to a former function or have a peaceful death. Um, it's defined as a state as, sorry, ease is defined as a state of um, con calm or contentment. So you have to go through relief to get to ease. And the same thing is kind of this kind of happens with transcendence so after you're in the state of calm or contentment you can go into transcendence which is where um you're able to be free of the pain and like function above it and that's the goal for us to have all of our patients at the second dimension relates to the different holistic sections in which comfort can be applied so physical getting somebody a warm blanket psycho spiritual um, listening to them talking to them and these are just very brief explanations. Um, and then social, uh, getting somebody's family to see them, or like with COVID right now, getting them to FaceTime, or even um, like getting some financial support if the patient needs it, or getting them those resources. And then environment, keeping your patient's room clean, keeping it at a comfortable temperature, a good light for them, things like that. 
So the comfort theory is basically, so needs arise because of a negative stimulus. And then comfort is given as a positive stimulus to decrease the tension that comes from the negative stimulus. And then this will lead to health-seeking behaviors or a peaceful death, depending on their situation, like if somebody's a hospice patient versus a surgical patient. Um, and so basically, if somebody's comfortable, they're going to be more likely to be um, healthier, basically. And then they're more likely to demonstrate a desire to live. So if somebody's in a ton of pain, they're going to be like, okay, as terrible as this is, just like, kill me now, I can't handle it anymore. So if we can make them comfortable, they'll be more likely to want to take care of themselves and live longer because if you're comfortable, you want to be around longer to experience that comfort. So here's a picture of the comfort theory. So basically there is a negative stimulus situation, that gray box, I can wait at it with this. So then we're going to want to address the healthcare needs of the patient and their family and use comfort interventions as well as nursing interventions. And then that will lead to comfort. So comfort is, as we said, physical, psycho-spiritual, environmental, and social. And then that interchanges with the health-seeking behaviors. And internal behaviors can be like, I'm thinking that a patient is, um, is trusting their nurses more, or they're feeling like, okay, my pain's under control today, I'm good. Um, peaceful death is, death is pretty self-explanatory. They're not thrashing or um, groaning in pain. Then external behaviors, um, I'm impeded, so lack of crying or um, them like smiling or playing or having appropriate behaviors for their developmental age. Now, the significance of the comfort theory is that it's holistic. It treats the whole patient, not just the physical stuff, um, even though it does also include that. And it's more complex than the theory of pain or anxiety. And I believe that that was um, Potter, whose theory it was. And so she just kind of built on that, saying that comfort includes those things, but it's also so much more. And then um, it's a better scale. It measures what's important for the patient. So some patients, yes, it will be pain. Some patients, it will be seeing their loved ones. It just completely is focused on that patient and what they want. And then comfort is a term that nurses can recognize. Nurses are always trying to get their patients comfortable. And then it fills in missing pieces of care that can cause discomfort to the patient, but not exactly pain or anxiety. So having a dirty room, needing that reassurance, getting them the information that they need can always um, increase their comfort and give them better care. So this theory has been applied um, a lot of different ways. I found a lot of different articles using it, but the one that I was most interested in was the, how the comfort theory can be applied to pediatric nursing. Pediatric nurse, go figure. Um, basically, this article references the comfort theory and how it can be applied to pediatrics. They talk about how we need to have holistic care for the child and parents, which working with kids I totally agree with. And there's a protocol that includes completing a comfort behavior checklist and then using a treatment room so they have a safe space and having a list of comfort needs during an invasive procedure and having family present if possible during stressful situations. And the goal of that is to decrease stress and crying and increase the trust of the nurses, decreasing the needs of the medications for patients and sedation and having better family satisfaction with care. And also if they can decrease the length of stay for those kiddos, it's generally better for them. And there's also a measurement tool called the Children's Comfort Daisies, and it looks a lot like the faces measurement, and it's to measure how comfortable the child feels, not just with pain, but just how happy they are, and their little cute little daisies with little smiley faces, and it's a scale of 1 to 4. And for my research, I'm working on neonatal abstinence syndrome or NAS, and that's known for causing discomfort and irritability to infants as they withdraw from drugs um, that have transferred from mom through the placenta. And the comfort theory can be applied to the research about neonatal abstinence syndrome, and um, I want to specifically look at the use of non-pharmacological methods to increase comfort on top of the weans from the morphine and everything. And um, a scale similar to the pediatric nursing scale would need to be created. So we couldn't use the um, the children's comfort posies just because 
babies can't pick which posy they feel like. So if we could do something like a flack or an eye pass, but that measures comfort, I believe that that would be super, super helpful to measure the infant's comfort levels. And then we could also talk with the families. And then this theory is actually really ideal because of its attention to decreasing stressors and increasing comfort of whoever it's taking care of. So when a baby is being weaned, um, relief from discomfort is generally the ideal goal and keeping them as calm as we can and not irritable. Then just to finish up, this is an article about Kathy and she, um, it's a story about her when she was working as a nurse and she had a patient who didn't want to eat and she talked to her patient and the patient basically said that the food was just sounded terrible and it looked gross and she didn't want to eat it but she would really like a bowl of cream of wheat and so Kokaba went and got it and she handed fed it to the patient and the patient said that that totally jump-started their recovery and um that like that comfort care was what she really needed in that time and she would really appreciate that that Kokaba took the time to do that and then here are my references. Thank you.